Dr Galia, thank you so much for joining us. When we spoke to you a month ago, you were reluctant to really commit to this idea that we've seen a stabilisation or a peak in terms of the spread of the virus. Are you comfortable saying that now? We've certainly seen a peak um, in China. Uh, the, at around the, the time that we were having our interview, the numbers were just starting to decline. Now we have seen a definite decline. And indeed, this weekend, uh, there's been a milestone um, that was passed in which China nationally reported less than 100 cases, and then on the next day, less than 50 cases. This indicates that at least one peak has passed, but this is no uh, guarantee that it will remain so, and we have to remain vigilant. There is no room for complacency while the virus is circulating anywhere in the world. Where then are the next danger points that you would be looking very closely at, particularly as a lot of the country, between 60 to 80 percent that we estimate, is coming back to work and going back into communal spaces? What are you looking at as the potential for risk of reinfection? Uh, you would rightly indicate that the return to economic, uh, the, to a full economic activity has to be closely watched. Um, of course, there's every indication that this can be done, and we are seeing how uh, different grading of emergency or risk level is being done in China with a, with a very wide range, with a four-level uh, grading where uh, there's low-risk provinces and high-risk provinces, and the return to economic activity is being carefully calibrated and watched. Um, this is a very important point to uh, keep a lookout. Of course, uh, there's now many of the new cases being uh, identified, reported in the, in the recent days have been imported from uh, other countries that are now uh, facing the epidemic. And therefore, that's another possible cause of resurgence. So um, looking at the reentry into work and the pot potential reimportations are two um, major points of vigilance. Yeah, in fact, I think in the, the Monday numbers, the only cases outside of Hubei province were actually imported cases from Iran. So is that really a hotspot from where you could see further community transmission? And where, where else would you be looking at? And, and, and is there really a heightened concern that we could see a second wave of infections? There's always the possibility of resurgence, and it would be dangerous to just identify one country. Um, I think it's, it's, a, it's important to be looking at all the places where there is uh, community transmission happening. And there's WHO headquarters has published a, a, quite a long list of affected countries. Um, WHO remains uh, of the same advice. This is not a, an advice to do travel bans um, or trade restrictions. It is about showing the vigilance, especially for those countries that have ongoing transmission, and use the appropriate measures such as uh, uh, quarantine that has been so effective in the past two months. There's also been some increasing concern and, and confusion, I should say, over patients who are seemingly tested negative and having seemingly recovered and then subsequently were discharged and then tested positive again, or I think in one instance that patient actually then died. As, is there now a concern that, you know, this might have been a case of faulty testing or misdiagnosis, or is there a possibility that this is a persistent infection? It is difficult to speak about an individual case, especially when one has not been involved in it uh, entirely. One has, we have learned about this virus that it does take a long while um, to clear and that there is a potential for uh, uh, waxing and waning of the clinical syndrome. Um, it is important, therefore, to uh, keep the, the highest level of uh, vigilance, not just on the epidemiological side, but also in the case of the care of individual patients. And yes, unfortunately, um, uh, we have seen, although a minority, but definitely the virus is able to kill even young people. 
and therefore uh, this is uh, this is not one to be taken lightly. So we shouldn't assume that children, uh, that, that young people, as you say, are seemingly immune because so far the cases that we've seen almost point to that. It almost also seems to point to, uh, you know, women between the ages of 30 and 50 being kind of most resistant. In the studies that you've seen and the evidence that you've seen, is this the picture that gets painted? And if so, why are we seeing this trend? It's a very good question. Um, there's a big distinction between disease, which is what we have seen up to now, and infection, that is people who have the virus um, and who have, may have had um, a, a milder, unrecognized form of the disease. It does appear that people who have been labeled uh, asymptomatic are most often people who are in the prodrome, who are getting eventually symptoms and turn out to be uh, posy symptomatic with mild symptoms as opposed to asymptomatic. So, but we will only know that picture once uh, studies that are now underway uh, in China look for signs of the infection. We do so-called serology surveys looking for antibodies uh, in the blood. Now that these tests have become available, China is planning and conducting studies across the population to be able to see, especially in places like Wuhan, where there has been community transmission, to see how much of the population at large has been infected. And this will be extremely important for us also to understand what is the situation with children who appear in the current uh, data we have about disease appear not to be a driver of the uh, infection. But it's also important to see this before schools completely reopen, um, because that behavior, that transmission dynamic might change once you get children congregating again in the school. For most of the history of this epidemic, children have been isolated in households. And therefore, this question must remain one of the big unanswered questions that we have. I wanted to ask you about your thoughts on, on, on what the Chinese experience teaches the rest of the world. And I'll start with containment, because we're seeing Italy really put in place this Hubei-style lockdown containment strategy with about a quarter of the Italian population. Do you think it's been effective, and is that the most effective way to combat the spread of this virus? What the Chinese experience has shown is that um, there is no one way to, uh, to attack the virus. <laughs> it's a different, so I'll, I'll phrase that uh, more felicitously. There's no one way to resist um, and to draw out the epidemic. Certainly, the combination of actions that we have seen, this comprehensive solution that China has chosen from universal population measures, risk communication, telling people about hand hygiene, through to, at the other end, the lockdown, of a city like Wuhan has clearly uh, blunted the epidemic and in many provinces drawn it out to allow the health services time to cope and not to have too much of a workload. But it's important to understand that it is not one. Uh, there was one story, the Wuhan story, which we all understand has led to a lot of pain um, for that population. Um, and uh, a, a high cost for society as a whole, we must recognize them for the sacrifice that they have made and the learning and the protection that they have given to the rest of the country and the world. But at the same time, it is only part of a calibrated or graduated approach based on risk assessment and on the evidence of community infection. So there are many intermediate ways uh, active case finding, contact tracing, and, and uh, movement restrictions uh, before you get to the mass lockdown. What's the ideal protocol when it comes to testing them? Because there's a lot of criticism about the situation in the US, uh, even here in Australia, a lot of praise for South Korea in terms of how divergent the amount of testing is going on and how much that's perhaps contributing to the amount of community transmission that's also happening. From the Chinese experience, what would you say best practices would be in terms of the number of people and the types of people that are being tested? One simple way that I, I look about at it after nine weeks of uh, living uh, the virus back uh, day, day and night 
is that it's always one week ahead of you. Um, that's always one to two weeks ahead of where you think it is. And it is only by doing testing um, uh, appropriately that you can get a picture of how much uh, infection there is in the community. And there are established protocols, for example, um, testing people with influenza-like illness uh, to understand how uh, people who have uh, presented randomly, not for COVID-19, but for uh, other respiratory patterns, how, uh, those, how many of those people have got the virus themselves. Um, doing rather more than less tests is one way of uh, having an assurance of how far. Are we still at the stage of sporadic clusters, uh, of sporadic cases? Have we started to get clusters in households um, or in workplaces or in other uh, places where people gather? Um, have we started to find that in these uh, population tests, we are finding a proportion uh, of people positive who are suggestive that the virus has now started to spread um, through uh, unknown chains of transmission. Uh, this can only be done by doing, as I said, rather more than less tests.